Hi, I'm Noel T. Manning II, and I appreciate you guys spending time with us right here on Meet Me at the Movies. We are excited always when we get a chance to reach out to our audience and, and reach out to filmmakers. I'm very happy to have Diane Paragas with, with us today. Diane, did I get that right? You did. That is probably the best pronunciation I've ever heard. Off the bat, that is perfect. <laughs> well, thank you. Are you Filipino? <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. You are the writer and the director uh, for the film called Yellow Rose. And this is not your first film, but I, I definitely want to talk to you about Yellow Rose um, and the journey to that. But I also want to get some background on your journey into filmmaking and, and where that love came from. Because in watching this film, it's obvious that you have a deep love for filmmaking and a love for storytelling. Oh, thank you. I do. I definitely do. Um, so I'm one of those people who didn't go to film school, um, although I definitely am a cinephile. And in college, I did film studies as part of my studies. But it was really because um, I think there just weren't a lot of female directors at the time. And I honestly didn't know that it was an option. It just didn't occur to me because it's just not something people were doing when I was in college. So I didn't study filmmaking, although I was a big fan. And, um, and it wasn't until I kind of got my first dr real job, I, I became an agency producer. And I hired this company called Udirect. Okay. And they allowed the agency producers to direct. And so I was like, look, I'm this kid, I'm happy to be in this position. But I'm gonna hire you guys if you teach me how to direct. Yep. And that's how I learned was on the job. Wow. So I learned through commercials, which I still do today. I, I'm a commercial director. Okay. And, um, and that's kind of how I got my start. And, uh, and then I kind of moved on into television and I made my first documentary a couple of years later. Um, and it's, I think around that time I wrote Yellow Rose and I tried to get it made and it was a very long journey to get it made. And at the time, everyone was like, nobody wants to see this movie. Nobody wants to finance it. <laughs> there were people that wanted to maybe finance it if I changed the lead character to another race. Wow. Um, and it just was very important for me that it be a Filipino story. So I put it on the shelf for a number of years and kind of continued directing um, and kind of became a documentary filmmaker. Um, even though I'd always loved fiction, that's kind of how the road kind of led me to that. Um, and I went on to make uh, a movie called, my first sort of feature length uh, documentary is called Brooklyn Boheme, mm -hmm. which came out in 2012. It won the Black Reel Award, we were on Showtime, it opened Ur Urban World Festival. Um, and around that time is when I picked up again with Yellow Rose because I felt like maybe this was the time yeah. to come back to it. And it still took a couple more years. And a couple years later, I did a short. And then a couple years later, I got financed to do the feature. And so that's the long and the short of it. It, it I think in all that time, what kept me going was frankly, there were no other Filipino films. There were no other big movies that had a Filipino lead. Um, and I'm so proud to say that Yellow Rose is the first Filipino film, you know, distributed by a major Hollywood studio um, for theatrical release. So it was worth the journey. And I'm just so excited that even in these times, we get to release our film in a big way. Yeah, yeah, it's so great that Sony decided that this was worthwhile. You knew it yes. was the whole time, but when you get someone like that uh, that says yeah we we want to do something with this and it is it's i think the last few years there has been such an amazing outpouring for international cinema uh and i say international kind of across across the board because i, I look back at roma a few years ago and then parasite and and i love the fact that we are looking at film in a way of let's look at what's the best and what are the best stories and who cares about the subtitles let mm -hmm. them speak let the actors speak let this let let that roll and wash over you and uh, i'm so excited that audiences are going to be able to see this 
because uh, as you said, this is something that you have been such a part of for so long. You've worked for it. You have um, sweated, you have cried for it. And here it is for audiences to see. Uh, yes. I just thank you for, for taking that journey and being willing to do what it takes to bring it to us. Thank you. I mean, you know, I think this movie particularly um, is, as much as it is a Filipino film, it is an American film because it's about country music. It's, it's about, you know, I grew up in, in Lubbock, Texas. So it's, it's kind of this fond remembrance of those, that time for me. Um, but it's also a very timely story about what's happening in this country in regards to the undocumented experience. Um, but at the same time, it's the journey of a girl who has a dream to be a country singer. It's very much a story that we, is a beloved type of story, but told through this different lens and this particular experience of this girl. So I think that, I hope that people will uh, embrace it as much as an American film as, as it is, um, as you say, kind of a story of the other. Yeah, but I think, you know, I, I sort of stand on the shoulders of those movies like Roma, like, like Parasite, like The Farewell, like Crazy Rich Asians. Yeah. You know, Hollywood is a very risk averse place. And when, when movies like that do well, it opens the door a little bit wider for movies like mine. Yeah. So um, I know that that was the climate under which Sony did take it on but I'm so grateful. It was a big risk for them to take this film on and they did. And it, it means so much, not just to me, but for other Filipino filmmakers to know that there's a place for our stories. Yeah, absolutely. Going back to your love of documentary, how much did that help you in creating this, this narrative in a, a fictional piece? Because I, I've worked on documentary, so I know the effort that goes into telling that story. Talk about mm -hmm position and maybe how that helped you? Yeah, definitely. I, I did my documentary um, due diligence. I went to detention centers and I visited families who had been um, through this experience where they were, one parent was detained and some, some of the kids were separated. And I did this sort of mini documentary in my early research. Um, so that definitely was part of it. Also, when we shot, we shot in real locations. We shot in real honky tonks in Austin, Texas. We shot in a real motel. And um, we were very kind of, we we're a very nimble crew as far as narrative film goes. Um, you know, just down and dirty. Sometimes it was just me and the, the sound guy and the gaffer and the actor, and that was it. And, and we would go into these locations to shoot. So that was definitely, um, the way we shot it was very documentary-esque. The whole thing was shot uh, handheld. Wow. But we did shoot on the Alexa. We did shoot with vintage anamorphic lenses, but with this sort of spirit of sort of fly on the wall. And, and that was something I kind of wanted to achieve. Talk about the music and your love of music and how that was infused in the story and why that was important for you. Well, I played music. It was kind of my outlet. I wrote some of the songs in the film. And, um, you know, music is just a part of who I am as a person. But I have to say this movie brought that very much back into my life. Yeah. Um, and I was just very involved in the musical side of it. Um, and, you know, it was all coming, the spiritual, you know, center of the movie and the music is Dale Watson. So mm -hmm. Dale plays himself in the film. It's his, a lot of the music is from him and the parts that come from Rose were sort of amalgamation of the actors who played the role and myself and Dale coming up with the sound that Rose would have. Yeah. And, and it was that way that we kind of created the, the music that comes from her. Yeah. Um, so to me, that's, you can't separate the two. And then of course we have the extraordinary performance of Eva Noblezada, who I'm so excited for people to see because she really is a star and um, a star is born. And I, I, I'm so excited for, for, for people to, to hear her extraordinary voice and to watch this heartbreaking performance. But um, just to sum it up, I mean, like music is definitely a big part of who I am as a director. 
In fact, my next film that I'm writing now is a musical, a full on pop opera set in World War II in the Philippines. So it's a big, it's a much bigger canvas, much bigger movie, but very musical. So it just, it, it's sort of like, it kind of grew back in me and it's definitely part of me now. Wow, that, yeah, and you, you talk about the, the acting and the casting and musically amazing, but the acting just as much. Thank you. It was such an amazing balance of both and that is difficult to do sometimes in films about singing and songwriting to find that, that balance where you've got the acting as elevated as the, the music and you were able to do that. So congrats on that. And Thank you. The, the casting itself, did you know mm -hmm. in who you wanted for this? Um, yes and no, that's a good question. I just around the time I, I shot a short film that we did kind of as a proof of concept leading up to the feature. And for that, we were starting the casting process, knowing that this would be an opportunity to look for an unknown actor to play the lead in the feature as well. So we did the big search all over the country and we, I saw hundreds of girls. But around the time we started that process, Eva had just been cast as Miss Saigon uh, in the West End um, in the revival of Miss Saigon. And I was like, no, because the whole time I was like, you know, this is going to be like when they searched for Leia Salonga when the original came out and we have to find our own Miss Saigon. And then they decided to revive it and they cast this girl. Yeah. And I remember seeing her and I was just like, oh no, she's so perfect. Yeah. But I knew she was going to be in that for a while. And we did have an extraordinary young uh, woman who played Rose in the short. And she actually is one of the people that wrote Square Peg, which is kind of our main song and we wrote it on set with Dale who was in the short and her name is Thea Magia and so she was kind of that spiritual uh she created that song with us um but then years later when I got finally got the full financing it just so happened that Eva was ending her run uh, for Miss Saigon and she had this tiny window in between Hades Town, which won the Tony as you know for best musical and she was nominated so she had a window in between finishing Miss Saigon and going off to begin Miss uh, to begin Hades Town, and that's when we shot this film. So it's been we were really lucky to get her in that little pocket um, of time, and it's been quite a journey. So at 23 years old, Eva is a two-time Tony nominee and a Grammy winner. Yeah, amazing, absolutely. Yeah, amazing. she was she was phenomenal in this. You talk about the journey. I think with any journey you take in a project there's always a moment when you know, yes, we got something. Mm. Sometimes that happens at, at the end of it. Sometimes that happens at the beginning. Sometimes it's as you're doing it. Do you remember that moment when you realized, yeah, we've got something here? I have to tell you, it was the first day we met Eva because I cast her just from watching her on the stage. I actually didn't audition her. I just watched her in Miss Saigon. That night I had dinner with her and offered her the part. Oh. And, um, and that was it. So I hadn't seen her in the role. And we hadn't, I did one reading maybe a couple of weeks before we started shooting. But until we got on set, I, I had no idea. And you don't really know, you know, what you have. And this is the, this is the, this is the bane of filmmakers existence. You know, you just, you just don't know until everything's together, got the camera on. And, but when we put the camera on her and she started strumming square peg and we had her in the locations, we all kind of were like, okay, we all have to kind of up our game. And so it was really on day one. And then from that point on throughout the filming, which was only 19 days, by the way, because of our limited budget, um, I was just writing new scenes. I was so inspired by her ability as an actor that I kind of kept pushing the story even more. And and we were just sort of creating stuff. My my line producer hated me because I kept writing pages during the night. And I even wrote a song during the shooting, which is called Quietly Into the Night, that's in the film, because I just kept feeling the moment. And I think that's kind of how I direct. Um, I play jazz music in addition to other types. And I think I probably direct like I play music and that's very, not extemporaneous, but 
you, you're kind of, your senses are open to the possibilities of magic, ris irrespective of whether it's on the page or not. And you, you just create this environment and your job is to find the magic. Right. And some directors are very deliberate in how they do that. I think I'm more intuitive in trying to feel what's happening between the actors. What is the location telling us? What is the light telling us? Mm -hmm. How do we weave this into a larger story? All of those things. And that's, I think I work like that. I know I work like that. And that, that's, that's how I've always directed. Well, I've always thought that collaboration is not just collaborating between other people. It's also collaborating within your environment. With Definitely. Being, like you said, the magic. Let the magic help you collaborate. And it seems like that's exactly what was happening with this. Yeah, I, that, that's definitely, and, and I think we had to be like that just because of our limited budget and things would just not work. And then you're like, okay, pivot, let's do this. And this is actually better, you yeah. know? Um, so I think it was also partly the way we were shooting the film and the restraints that we had on us. It just made the movie be the way it is. And I think it's, it's, it worked out, you know, it feels very authentic and I hope true. Yeah, it does. It, it's organic, as you said. Organic. That's a good word. Yeah, organic. Yeah, it was very, very real. I, I, I love this film. And um, do you have any final thoughts or, or final words that you would want to share about Yellow Rose? Yeah, I just please, um, you know, come come out and, and see it. And, um, you know, I think the theatrical experience is something that I think we all kind of miss. And um, and, you know, I certainly intended this film to play in a theater and it would be, you know, it would be great if you, you would give us a chance and, and see this movie. Yeah, I highly recommend it. Uh, Diane Paragas, thank you so much. Writer, director for Yellow Rose, your time is so valuable and thank you for joining us right here on Meet Me at the Movies. Thank you so much. Till next time, I'm Noel T. Manning II and that is a wrap.